In this lesson, we're going to check out what I think are three really standout sections from this amazing version of Yamar from Clifford Ball. Hopefully, these can help us to create our own unique sound as we improvise. In this first example, we're going to look at a couple different things that we can maybe take for our own playing and throw into certain situations if they arise. And um, there's just some little things we can uh, really dig into here. So the first thing we want to do is look at the position that we're playing in um, for the opening of the solo. And the, the way I would think of this is he's kind of basing everything that he's going to do, in the first bit at least, uh, around this A first inversion. So... Um, if you can imagine uh, like a G chord shape, um, but shifting it up uh, instead of a G, making it an A, because we're in the key of A, that's kind of where our home base is. It's just that we're an octave up. Now, um, you could also think of the pointer finger on the 14th fret as kind of your anchor point to do a lot of this stuff. Okay, so let's look at the first little bit here. We're going to... Um, start on the fifth fret and kind of slide all the way up to the position I was just talking about. I'm going to play a little bit of this really slowly and then talk a little bit about it and how we can use it and really what's going on. So... Now, just right in that little bit of music, there's a lot going on. So we slide up, and then we outline an A major chord. Now, um, if you can visualize it, you know, again, thinking of like how you how you would see a G major chord. And I'm referencing this because this is just a really familiar chord shape. It's just that we probably more associate it with a G, but it's only a G because that's where we're, our root is. Now, if we take the same kind of thing, you can see that I've got open, open, third fret. Now, if I were to shift up two frets, that means it would be two, two, five, because we're just adding two frets to whatever we were, we were doing here for this shape. Now, when he slides up, he's just doing the upper structure of that chord going from major third to root. So th those little things are really useful because we can start to imply chords in our playing just by harmonizing um, the notes that we're playing. Uh, and you can do it in just a little two note, you know, dyad kind of voicings. And that's what he's doing. Now, he, he hits an F sharp here. This is the 14th fret of E. The second chord we're playing is an F sharp minor. So that, that works really well over that. Um, and then, now the next little bit is really why I chose this particular section to look at. He does this little lick where we go... Um, Now, uh, that little part right there with that B flat in there, or really I should call it A sharp, I guess. Um, what's happening there, if we really break that down, is that he's implying an F sharp 7 chord. Um, anytime you have this little shape here, if you're going, you can either think of that as a, uh, a diminished triad, or you can think of, of it as the seventh chord that it's attached to. So in this case, if I were to do like a, an F sharp seven, I could use this diagonal shape that a lot of us probably are familiar with. It's a really common shape on the guitar. It's just a, 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 a diagonal. And now you can really start to hear the chord if I add that root note. And um, now, the reason that this is happening, from, just from an analytical standpoint, is that the chord after the F-sharp minor that we were just playing is a B minor. Now, F-sharp 7 would be the dominant chord that leads in to B, because F-sharp is the 5 of B. We're, we're kind of tricking the ear into thinking we're changing from the key of A to the key of D. We're not really, but temporarily we kind of are. We're just setting the ear up for that. 
Um, so that's how we can make sense of that little, that diminished triad that we're doing, this little. And notice that then we go into this um, uh, D natural note. We're up here on the 15th fret of the B string. Um, and it just leads the ear perfectly to that. So rather than me talking about it a bunch, let me play it again and then kind of maybe talk through as we go. So here's the A. F sharp. And then this little slide up implies that the F sharp is an F sharp minor, which it actually is. If, uh, and also, I, I should have said this before, if you haven't seen the last uh, Helping Friendly look that I did on Yamar and the chords of it, it really will set you up really well to understand what's going on this a little a, a little better, just because we can look at the different spots on the neck where Trey's approaching this. Um, so anyway, we've got A, F sharp minor, now here's this little um, diminished, and again, you can think of it as F sharp 7, and then now the next little bit is implying a B minor, which is really what we were setting ourselves up for with that F sharp 7. It's got that, you know, Allmere Brothers kind of sound. So let's recap that a little bit. We've got an A major, F sharp minor 7, now F sharp dominant, so we're going from minor to major, a little dominant, and then the B minor, and it's a B minor 7 then. Now the E is happening there because the last chord is an E, so when we hit that, it makes perfect sense because that's the root of our last chord in the progression. So, if anything, what I'm trying to get across is that he's very um, intentional about the chord tones that he's hitting over whatever chord is happening at that time. Um, and with your own playing, that's just something to play around with is kind of mapping out the different chord shapes. That was part of the whole point of the last lesson I did for you, Mar, it was looking at um, doing things in root position, doing things in first inversion, doing things in second inversion. Um, if some of these things I'm talking about are not familiar to you, just leave a question below and I'll try to answer it the best I can, or leave an, uh, or shoot me an email um, if you have a question. Uh, it might take a minute to get back, but I definitely will get back to you if you have a question about it. Um, but the, the main point is that we're playing specific chord tones to match what's being played by the rhythm players. Uh, and creating harmony and creating a really melodic sounding uh, solo. If you if you haven't heard this entire solo, you know, go back and really listen to it. And you can hear just how beautiful and melodic it is. It's not just random notes being thrown around and him just going as fast as he can. It's really a, a pretty um, uh, improv that he's doing here. So hopefully we can take some of this and apply it to our own stuff. So uh, now after that, um, let's see here. We're going to move forward and he does a little just major pentatonic lick. And that's just, you know, basic A major uh, pentatonic kind of stuff, starting on the 14th fret. This next line is kind of interesting. Now that last lick I just did was also a big part of why I wanted to include this section of this, uh, this uh, solo. Um, then what happens is we have this, you know, this little line, and that's that's fine. That's all in the you know A major slash A pe major pentatonic. But then this next part, uh, uh, starting on fifteenth fret of D. That's really a fascinating little part that's happening there. He's he's hitting. I'm not, you know I'm not sure if he meant to do that 15th fret of D, but it's really cool because it's implying kind of a, a D minor instead of a D major. So F natural is the minor third of D. Um, so he's starting out. So when I hear that little bit of that. It makes me think, or what, what I hear when I hear that, is a D minor 6. 
so this is something you can definitely throw into your playing as well to create a little extra tension. You know, some of these these notes, um, like that note in particular, and then when I was talking about the diminished triad, those are things you can create tension with. And then it makes your, when you release from the tension, it makes it way more effective. Um, and it adds more color. You know, it just, it, it makes it a little more interesting than just going for the, the you know, normal diatonic tones of, uh, of A or going with just the pentatonic. Um, so again, that, that lick there is going to go 15 of D, 14 of G, 16. And then this is interesting. Now he goes 14, which is the major third of D, and then goes up to an A. So we can think of that as like a little D major triad. You know, look at these little tiny parts. All it is is a bunch of little licks put together really fast. You know, that's all it ever really is. It's little simple things. So here it is again. Uh, um, such a such a cool uh, lick. Now, after that, he does this little sweep. Now, getting to this part, this is another reason I wanted to talk about this section is because now we can look at how he uses a slide to move into a different position um, and approach the, the melody in a different kind of way. So we were in this A first inversion kind of spot right here, if you want to think of it that way. Um, that's how I, I think of that. But what he does is he goes, and then his first finger slides down to 13, and then he picks that note and uses that to slide down. And I'm going to play this next little lick and then break it down. So you can see how he used that, that little slide move. He did it over a couple different licks to get down into a root position like this. Um, so you can play your major scale there, you can play your major scale from here. So it's, um, this is one thing I'll have um, students do if they're trying to improve their improvising, is make sure they know how to play the major scale in a bunch of different ways, because that's usually the foundation of a lot of the things we'll be doing. And so this is what he's doing, he's taking elements of the major scale in first inversion, as a vehicle to get down to a new position. So a lot of really valuable stuff. One other thing that I would really work on, which ties into the, the last Yamar lesson I did, is whatever position you're in, if you're in a first inversion or a root position or second inversion, whatever the case is, try to map out where all the, the chords are for the key. You know, trying to play an A, a B minor, a C sharp minor, a D, an E, an F sharp minor, and even the G sharp half diminished, try to play that in each one of those spots and map that out. Now that just takes a little time, um, but it's really, really worth it because then no matter what position of the neck you're in, you'll be able to hit all of the chords in the key that you're playing at any given time. I, that's the goal that I'm always striving for, and I think it's worth exploring or at least thinking about. The next example uh, we're going to look at next because it's going to have some other really fun stuff, and it's going to be in a different position. So we'll check that out in a second. All right, now moving on to the next uh, example here. The reason that I chose this one is uh, kind of twofold. Uh, one of which is it shows just how seamlessly Trey uh, transitions from one position to another position, back to one, and then up to another one. So he, he's going to start uh, out in this A major root position kind of uh, spot right here, seventh fret of D, and creating a diagonal. Like I was talking about earlier in the context of that F sharp 7 chord that we were checking out. But now it's just going to be an A major chord. And he kind of slides up to the root. 
and just outlines the triad just just like that. And then that little move. Um, think of it this way: if you have this shape and you're in a jam, and let's say it's just vamping over like an A major, <clears throat> one thing you can always do over a major chord that'll work really well is you can do that diagonal, and then you can always go to the major six, the root, the second, and then if you want, you can you know do a bend. And actually, we're gonna get into a lick in a little bit that kind of does that in a different way. So instead of a bend, he's going to go and do a slide to move into a new position. But the main point is if you have a major chord, you can always do, um, I always call it the B.B. King lick because it kind of reminds me of him. You know, that kind of bluesy thing. <clears throat> so even that right there is a cool thing you can, you can use and you can mix and match. And then you can, you know, throw in some little, like maybe a little bluesy minor third, to major third, and then some chromatic stuff. Um, but the main point is the shape. The shape is really where it's at. And then he shifts down and does this. I think of it as a, a um, almost like a a B minor. But really, we have, we've switched to the. Um, F sharp minor at that point, but he does fourth fret of the G, and then remember the, the the shape that we were looking at way up here in the first example. Now we're we're back to that, but it's an octave lower now. So when he does this, um, that's how I would think of that. That's just your A major chord. Add four, A five. You know, I I think if you can relate the chord tones to the chord that's being played, all the better. Instead of just thinking of random frets that you're playing, really connecting the sound of what's being played with the chord behind it. Um, so that part. And then we just we pretty much repeat that, and then something else interesting is going to happen in a second. So we slide back up to that A, now that is the thing that we did earlier up here, we did it way up high. So you can see how he creates these little themes, <clears throat> and then repeats them, and then tweaks them a little bit to make them more interesting. So. This is that, again, I think of it as a D minor 6. It's got a really cool sound. That's the kind of sound you would hear, like in uh, It's Ice would have that kind of vibe, um, a minor 6 kind of vibe. But anyway, so coming from that slide to A, he goes... That's the thing I was saying was kind of Almond Brothers-ish up here. So same thing, just an octave lower. We did something similar to that, maybe a little different rhythmically, but the, the notes were the same. And then he gets into this, um, this little theme that he kind of goes in and out of during this entire jam, if you listen to the whole thing, and it's like this. Well, just... We're going to actually see that pop up in the third example that we're going to look at in a minute. Um, but the power of making like a little motif, and that's so simple. For a listener, that's really nice because we have something we can latch on to. If somebody's just shredding super fast and it's just this flurry of notes, it almost doesn't have any meaning because you have nothing to you know, uh, uh, contrast it with. or There's nothing that repeats, you know. Uh, so... I think that having a little uh, theme that repeats is a really cool, you know, really powerful thing for a soloist in general. Um, and he definitely is doing that in this. <clears throat> so on the fourth fret, or sorry, second fret of D, he just goes, and then four of G, and then C sharp. Uh, and that's creating, the way I hear that is like an A9, because that B is being put right here on the fourth fret of G. And it's just a really pretty sound. Like if you play that as a chord, an A9 chord, it's just a peaceful, happy sounding chord. And that's the vibe of this jam anyway. It's kind of upbeat, that 
kind of hoppy, you know, like uh, bouncy sounding thing. So um, now, right after that, though, is the other part I wanted to talk about this this section because then after he does this, uh, then we're gonna um, uh, uh, let's see, we're gonna do this uh, pentatonic lick. Uh, something very similar but the, the main point is he uses that to get back up into this a root position that we started in for this section but he, he doesn't stay long he does the thing I was talking about with that major um, it's just a, a major pentatonic kind of lick but he uses a slide to get up into the ninth fret and now we're gonna get into uh, a different position of A. A couple different ways you can think of this next part. I'll just play it and then kind of talk through it. He's going to go... Now, similar to how I was describing how you may want to think of this uh, position up here, um, is you can either do think of it as A first inversion. If you put pinky here, that would make it A root position. Um, but we can take this same kind of chord shape and then place it down here so that we have pinky on 12 of A. And then we build like a C chord. That would be like the shape you do for a C chord. It's just that we don't have open strings. So we have to do a little bit of a different fingering to cover all the strings. Anyway, you can see that this is going to be where all the notes are. We're hitting just, just about all the chord tones here. He starts with a little... Um, uh, if you think of like how a lot of times... On a D chord, you have that like added pinky kind of, you know, that kind of vibe. He's doing that, but just in an arpeggio instead of in like a chord strumming situation. So it'll be like this, 10 of E. So just that little chunk there, it's like a D chord shape. And then he does a slide up from 9 of D to 11. Uh... And that is another thing he uses is a way to slide up even higher because he's kind of building. Uh, that's the thing. He, he went down low and had some cool themes. And then as the, the solo is building up in energy, he's going higher and higher pitch wise because usually that's, you know, if we think of the times when the house lights come on and he hits those high notes, it's usually when he's going higher. It's just more, um, uh, more effective as like a climax to a jam. Um, not that this one gets out of control crazy like a, really high energy, you know, hairy hood or something, but it's it's um but it's awesome nonetheless. So so we started all the way down here um at one point, made our way to this position, then to this position. So I'll play this lick again so you can see that starting on 10 of E. And and it's a really pretty melodic sounding line that has a lot of the chord tones a lot of the major pentatonic and it gets you from one place to the next. So, um, you know, again, to tie it back into my last Yamar lesson, uh, all of these different positions have so many different little things you can get out of them and different ways you can create movement in your solo going from here to here, to here, to here. Cause here's the thing. We're, we're really just using a lot of the same notes, no matter where we are, but because of the different positioning and the different shapes that we get out of those positions, it can inspire some different kinds of licks or different lines than we normally would do in a different spot. All right, now for this final section that we're going to look at, um, we're going to be in a similar area to the second example, but it's going to have a little more kind of bluesy attitude happening here, and that's part of why I wanted to talk about this part too. Um, it's a bit of a variation on the sound that we had before. So we're going to slide up uh, from four to six on G to start it. So I'll just I'll play it kind of kind of at tempo, just a bit of this lick, and then break it down a little bit. <laughs> So right there, that is, that is such a, a little tray line and uh, a lot of good stuff we can get out of it. So the first little bit, you can just see that we're pretty much outlining the, 
the chord tones for an A major. But then we go to this major six. So we, we then we do this bluesy thing where we slide from the minor third. And and then do the seventh fret of the G string, and then the fifth fret, and that's more like a minor pentatonic. Uh, so it's like a mixture of an A major chord, and then minor pentatonic. Then from there, we're going to slide down and go from two to four on the D string and go to major pentatonic right, right after that. So we're kind of combining the elements of bluesy for a little bit of that it almost has like a bluegrassy, you know, a little attitude to it. And then we go to this. Uh, uh, so I'll play that really slowly. And, you know, most of that's just the, the major pentatonic. Well, all of it is. But one note worthy part is that little bend lick. So it's a bend up. Bend down, pull off, and then four of D. If that's a lick that's not familiar to you, it's really worth um, checking that out. It's a lot of fun, and it's very, you know like it's really old school Trey. Like he would do that like a lot more, kind of more back in the day. Um, that would be a lick he would do. Uh, so. Each one of those could be its own little thing to practice. Now, moving on from there, we're going to go. And that's cool and everything. That's just major pentatonic, but the next lick is really cool. Uh, uh, there, now, let, let's look at that, because there are two main things that are really fun in there to play around with. A little chromatic... There's a chromatic uh, uh, thing that happens where you're just connecting the dots. Like, think of your A major chord like this. You have an A, a C sharp, that's your major third, and then E is your fifth. Now, a lot of times what you can do, just about anywhere you are in the chord, is connect from one chord tone to the next with a chromatic little uh, bit in the middle. So for going from the major third, chromatically up. That's that's also a real Jerry Garcia kind of thing. You'll hear him do stuff like I can't play like Jerry, but that's the kind of thing that's going on is connecting chord tones chromatically and filling in the space. Um, so I'm going to go back to the bend lick and flow into the the next part, and we can check it out there. So we're going to go. pause and, and talk about that because this this little bit here not only do we have the chromatic thing that I was just talking about but then you can see that we um, we slide up to the major third outline an A chord just think of how you play an A chord right here and then he does that little move that Trey does all the time when he's sliding, you know. Um, I did the lesson for Maze, a live version, also from um, uh, kind of the earlier 90s era, and he does that same kind of thing up high, that little slide thing, and he does it right here as well. So we go. be a little different but the more important thing is just getting that that um uh, chord shape mm -hmm. under your fingers and getting that movement going and, and taking this and doing stuff that you can use for your own jam um but you know oftentimes if you're on especially if you're landing on the fifth of a chord which is what we're doing here um that's a good spot to throw that in or the major third works really well you can see he slides into the major third a lot <laughs> 
that kind of thing. Um, so th- this also brings up a good point. Um, there's a quote by Victor Wooten. Oh, well, I, maybe I won't try to quote it because I'm not sure I'm going to do it exactly right. But in his book, The Music Lesson, which I really recommend if you haven't read that, there's a part where he talks about how no matter what you're playing, no matter what the key is, no matter where you are in your fretboard, you're always, bare minimum, a, a semitone away from a chord tone. And um, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, you know, if you're improvising, just because of the nature of it, there are going to be times where you might hit something that you didn't really mean to do. And that's not really the important thing. I think that what you do right after that is what counts, you know. So um, not only that, but purposely hitting a note that's not in the, the, the scale or that is not a chord tone can be a really cool sound if you lead into it. It can be a little passing tone. It could be a neighboring note thing where you're like, uh, 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 you can outline, you can kind of surround the note you want to play and, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can do it, but basically the, the idea is you can take a note that shouldn't technically really work, that isn't technically in the key, but you can make it work. And, uh, Trey is a master of that. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm going to play that whole section that I just did one more time. And then here's the part, um, this came up in the, the last example, and I, and I was saying that it would come up again. Um, he ends up doing that, the part that I said sounds to me like kind of like an A major 9 kind of sound. Um, and he just kind of varies the rhythm. Um, and just does that a bunch. I'm, the, the transcription link will be uh, down below, so you can check that out as well. But the next part is, is kind of cool and it ties everything together with that a uh, little bit of chromatic, but then it builds in a different way. So let's look at the end of this, this part. Um, and th- that's kind of what I was talking about before, where you take some notes that kind of, you know, technically shouldn't be there. Really the only one is this fourth fret of B. That's definitely not in the key, but it sounds so awesome in that spot. And it creates a little bit of tension. And and it's it's just a timing thing, too. You just kind of need that. Uh, you need that, that extra note to make the lick work out timing-wise. Sometimes that's what it comes down to, is filling in with chromatic stuff so that rhythmically it makes sense, in, in this case, in 4-4. Four, four. I hope that that gives you some food for thought for your own playing. But really, I would I would reference this one with the last Umar I did and practice playing all the chords in the key of A. Well, whatever key you want to do this in, just practice all the, the chords in the key in root position. Practice all the chords in one spot in first inversion. Practice all the chords in the key in second inversion. And right there, that'll give you a ton of options to play around with in different angles you can approach things from and hopefully inspire you to uh, get your own improv going. So hope that helps as always, Um, and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks.